Welcome back. We're at session 46 in our study of spiritual gifts. We'll be studying the second part of what is your spiritual gift. There will be one more session that will deal with spiritual gift. By the end of the third session, I hope that you have a very good idea of what your spiritual gift is likely to be. In the last session, we completed an exercise, an activity, in which we listed the different positions we had had in a church and we tried to put down at least five. Some of you were unable to put five down and that's fine. For many people in seminary, you have many, many more experiences and you might want to list all of them to get a broader range of positions that you've been involved with. We then looked at each of those positions and we put a check mark next to the ones where we felt energized by the activity, where we felt that we were effective, and where we felt that God was at work. And if you had three checks, then the gift associated with that would likely be your gift. Where we ended was, what gift is matched up with each of those positions? Today I'm going to do a brief review of every one of the spiritual gifts. And I would like you to look at the positions where you had three checks. If you only had two checks, look at those positions. Listen to the spiritual gift. I'm just going to go through them briefly and then match them up with the positions that you had in the churches and we'll see if perhaps you can begin to identify your spiritual gift. I used myself as an example and there were three of them that all seem to indicate that I have the gift of teaching. I taught in Sunday school for the middle school students, I taught adult classes, and then I was a speaker on retreats for the adults. So all of those seem to be related to teaching. So now as you look at the positions that you listed, listen to these gifts and put a check mark next to the ones that you think might be related to your position. Well, we're going to start with the brain. We've tried to identify these gifts associated with parts of the body. Paul uses the body as an analogy for spiritual gifts. And this is not in the Bible, but it does help us understand which go gifts go with each section. The first gift is the gift of administration. This is the gift where the Holy Spirit empowers you to be able to make plans that will allow you to accomplish goals. That the church sets a goal, typically the leader of the church, and you're able, one at a time, to be able to plan how will we get that done. So if you think that one of your positions has that spiritual gift, put a check next to that, write down uh, administration next to it. The next one we talked about is faith. And faith, we said, is believing God 100% of the time. That you have absolutely no doubt that God will do what he says he will do. And when you engage in your spiritual life, when you're involved with activities at church, you have no question that God is at work. The third gift we talked about was the gift of knowledge. This gift, we said, was a gift where God has given you some very meaningful experiences in your life, a wide variety of experiences, and those get stored in your brain. And you have some stories and illustrations, some analogies, you have verses that you remember, and at just the right time, you're able to pull those up and use them in a conversation where everybody goes, huh, I understand and it clarifies the situation. The fourth and final gift that we said is associated with this is wisdom. Wisdom being you are able to know the Bible so well that you see principles in the Bible for living, how we should live right. And people come to you for counsel, for advice, and you are able to take those principles and then explain to the person what you think they should do. So these are the gifts of the brain. Then we'll continue on with the gifts of the eyes. And the, there's only two gifts associated with the eyes. 
The first one we said is discernment. Discernment is a gift where you are able to tell, sense in your spirit, is someone telling the truth or are they lying? Is someone being motivated by good motives or evil motives? Is someone pretending to be a Christian or really is a Christian? And so this is a way to defend the church from attacks of Satan so that he is unable to get uh, non-believers into the church and pretend that they're Christians. We would call that counterfeit Christians. They're not really Christians and they want to bring uh, confusion to the church and they want to divide the church. The next gift we talked about was leadership. Leadership, we said, was standing before the people. And it is an upfront gift. It's a gift where everyone knows that person has the ability through the Holy Spirit to come up with new ideas to make the church better. And they start to tell people about those ideas. We call that to cast the vision, to create a picture in people's minds about what it, this new idea is. People get excited. They want to come alongside and, and work with the person with the gift of leadership to make sure it happens. Often the person with administration helps the person with leadership actually accomplish uh, the idea that they have had. So now we've got the gift of the brain, the gift of the eyes. Now we'll go to the gift of the mouth. And in other words, these deal with words. And people with this gift include those with the gift of intercession. We call these people prayer warriors. They're people who love to pray. They pray regularly. They pray for long blocks of time. They pray fervently with real anguish in their spirits in order to bring the requests of the people of God before the throne of grace. And they can see God answer those prayers. And often the gift of intercession goes with the gift of faith. And that just increases their faith that there is a God, that he is, will answer a prayer, and that he will do what he says he will do. So that's intercession. The next one is the gift of interpretation. We mentioned that this is a gift that goes along with the gift of tongues, which we'll talk about in a second. It is the person whom the Holy Spirit comes and works through to be able to translate for the body of Christ what is spoken in tongues, in another language. And they do so not so much by giving it word by word by word, but they are able to explain the message in concepts so that people understand what God's message is. And I am very aware that there are some churches who do not believe in these gifts. If that's your church, then please uh, understand that we're sharing this for the entire body of Christ. The next gift is the gift of prophecy. Prophets live a very lonely life. Because prophets have to say things that are very difficult for people to hear, they receive a message from God. In other words, there's an idea that comes to mind. They sense it in their spirit that God has a message to give to a person, to a group of people, to the entire church. And like a, a tea kettle that is starting to get warm, when it gets up to 212 degrees, the water boils and out comes the steam. This is what happens with prophets. If they wait and they don't give the message, the pressure builds up and builds up and builds up where they can't take it anymore. And finally, they share the message with others. It's a message of encouragement. It's a message of comfort. It's a message of warning. Or it's a message of future events. So that's the gift of prophecy. Then we come to the gift of teaching. Teaching is the gift where people understand what the Bible says. And they are able to explain what the Bible says to the other believers in a way that is clearly understood. People come away knowing what the Bible means and more importantly, they know how to apply it to their own lives. 
there is uh, one more gift of the mouth, and that is the gift of tongues. Tongues is the gift where you either speak in the heavenly language, you don't know the language, but God knows the language and you use it in private worship of God. There is also a language where in church you speak a language unknown to you or the other people. It's a message from God to the church. Again, it's either of warning or of comfort or of instruction or of future events. And there must be someone with the gift of interpretation present. If there is not, as we learned before, the person must sit down and then they privately worship God. But this is a gift not meant for believers. It's meant for unbelievers. And Paul's suggestion was speak one at a time and no more than two or three. Same thing with prophecy. So now we have the gifts of the brain. Things associated with thinking. We have the gift of the eyes. These people are able to see things other people don't see. And then the gift of the mouth, to be able to speak in words things that are helpful to the body of Christ. So now we move down to the heart. In the gift of the heart, these are people who have deep compassion for others. They clearly fall in the category of caring for the church. They have concern for the body. They want to help the body. They come alongside those who are hurting, or they create situations where the body can fellowship together. Among these gifts are the gift of encouragement. And this, these are people who come alongside someone who is in danger of wandering away from the faith. They walk with them for a time and they make sure they build a trusting relationship with them. Not as a project, but because they really care about the person and they don't want them to leave the faith and wander away. And at a certain point where they have been compassionate, they've shown the side of God that's the God of love, then they show the side that's the God of justice where they give them a wake-up call and say, it's time to confess your sin, to repent, and to return to the church. Then there's the gift of hospitality. We said these are people who entertain strangers. They also entertain people within the body, but often they provide food and lodging for people who they, whom they don't know. We mentioned the example of a missionary who comes into town and is going to report to the church on what's been happening on the mission field. They need a place to stay. They don't live in that town. The person with hospitality opens up their home and with real joy invites uh, the missionary to come and stay with them. But they'll also have opportunities for the body to come together at their home. And they create an environment that is safe and comfortable where people can be themselves and talk about spiritual things. And then we talked about the gift of mercy. And the gift of mercy is the gift where someone has been hurt, someone has in pain, someone is suffered a loss. They are hurting. They are the forgotten. They are the ones who are the outcasts. And persons with the gift of mercy come alongside them to provide immediate care. We mentioned that the best example in the Bible is the person we call the Good Samaritan, who not only immediately took care of the person who was injured, but also went the extra mile to make sure that that person was taken care of and that they did uh, not continue to just lie in the street. The Good Samaritan not only stayed overnight and interrupted his travel plans, but then he told the uh, innkeeper, I'll come back and if there's any other expenses, I'll pay for them. Then we go to the gift of the hands. The gift of the hands are people who do practical tasks. They do things that help the church accomplish things that need to be done. And we said that among these are giving. And giving is where people have been given of God considerable resources, financial, material, and they willingly, 
joyfully, without any reservation, give privately, anonymously, to support the work of the church. And then God does an amazing thing. He gives back to them even more material possessions so that they can give it away once again. Then we said we'll go to the gift of healing. The gift of healing, one of the so-called sign gifts, is typically used within the body to help people be restored to wholeness. That it may be a physical injury, but it also could be one that is involved with the mind, mentally, with the heart, uh, emotionally, with relationships, uh, socially, as well as a spiritual problem that these people help address and bring the person back to uh, a normal state in their life. Often this, these are counselors who are able to assist. For the physical ones, typically they would be physicians, they would be doctors. Then we talked about the gift of helps. We said that helps is the gift where people do things behind the scene. They're hardly noticed. They do what needs to be done when it needs to be done. You need me to set up chairs, you need me to take down tables, I'm there, I'll do it. Can I help you uh, make phone calls, send emails, I'm there, I'll do it. And they don't receive typically any thanks for doing this, any sort of recognition for doing it, and they don't want it because they know that what they have done has helped the ministry to be successful. And in essence, what the gift of helps does, it frees other people up to be able to do their ministry so that others don't have to set up the tables and the chairs. They can focus on, what am I going to teach tonight? What am I going to present in this seminar? It is a wonderful gift. Then we talked about the gift of miracles. And miracles typically happen on the frontier of the gospel, where people have not had the opportunity to hear the gospel like we have. So we don't often see miracles in countries that are industrialized. We have been saturated with the gospel. We hear it on the radio. We see it on the TV. We go to church on the weekends. There are seminars. There are books. There are tapes. There are CDs. There are all kinds of things for people here to know the gospel. Therefore, they have no excuse for why they did not respond to God's invitation to receive Jesus Christ. But people who live in uh, developing countries, countries that most missionaries have not been to, where there isn't radio, TV, churches, and all of the rest, miracles often happen so that God demonstrates his awesome power in a way that people look at and they say, there must be a God. And we said that the essential definition of this is an act takes place that violates the laws of nature, violates uh, the laws of physics. That shouldn't have happened. It, it is impossible that that happened. But God can do the impossible. And then we just have one more area, and that's the gift of the feet. And there's only two here, and one is apostleship. The office of apostle ended when the first century apostles passed away. So by the early 100 ADs, there were no apostles left. So the office passed away. The gift continued. Apostleship, it essentially means one sent forth with orders to accomplish something, and you're sent by an authority. We mentioned that most missionaries are apostles, that they have been sent forth by a church to preach the gospel and bring people to Christ in other countries. But within a church, often these are the people who are sent forth to start a new ministry, sent forth to start a new church, and they just simply love to take on new responsibilities, get something going, make sure that it's running smoothly, and then they get bored and they want to start something else because God has given them that desire within them and the Holy Spirit comes within them to make it happen. The one last gift is the gift of evangelism. 
We are all supposed to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. But not all of us have the gift of evangelism. People with this gift are naturally inclined to talk to people about the gospel. But supernaturally, the Holy Spirit comes within them and gives them just the right words to say to people. And the Holy Spirit gives them a sense of when a person is ready to accept the gospel. And then they go through life looking for opportunities to initiate spiritual conversations. And they have a natural way of just turning the conversation around so suddenly you're talking about Jesus. And then people have an opportunity to hear the gospel and hopefully respond to the gospel. Well, these are the 21 gifts that I have been teaching about over these past 46 sessions, and there will be a total of 50 sessions. So we're in the last stages of this course. We strive to serve the contemporary Christian community with a variety of Christian educational and evangelistic resources. To see TVS Seminary's database, please visit tvsseminary.com. And often you can find out which gift do you have by taking a look at your life story. Where is it that God tends to show up in your life on a regular basis so that the Holy Spirit works through you to energize you where you come away and say, wow, I can't wait till I do that again instead of depleting your energy. Where is it that you sense that you are effective. Either people come to you and tell you how much your ministry meant to them, or you can read their nonverbal cues that they were in fact ministered to. But most importantly, where was charisma? Where was that supernatural power that was released through you where at the end of ministry you can say, God was here. Something happened and I can't explain it through my own natural abilities. Therefore, I cannot take credit for it. And if you have not had such experiences, if you're a believer, you will. Because as you minister and as you're faithful in serving others as everyone should do, the Spirit will begin to work through you to touch other people's lives. And where you go out and you try this gift and you try that gift and that didn't seem it and you try this gift, suddenly there will be one where you say, yeah, I did enjoy that and I felt energy. And people did tell me that it was effective and meaningful and I really can't take credit for what happened. That's your gift. So if you say right now, I only had a couple of things on my list. Or if you say, I never really sh have seen God show up in a way that I can't explain. Keep serving. Go out and get a lot of ministry experience. Try a bunch of things. Try things that you think you will like. Try things that you think you won't like. But try. Go in there. And then ask people who are mature believers to give you feedback so that because they're a little further along on the journey of becoming like Jesus Christ, they will give you good feedback on what they saw happening as you served. So listen to them as well. Well, we have come to the end of session 46. We have one more session in order to try to clarify, identify what the gift is. But I want to say to everyone one last time, you cannot Find your spiritual gift by taking a test, although it may be helpful. Typically, it helps you identify your strength. The only way you can find your spiritual gift is to serve and to notice what happens when you serve. 100% of God's people are expected to serve. We are commanded to serve. So, serve. Please join us in the next session where we'll do one more activity to try to help you identify your spiritual gift. Thank you for joining us.